All right. Let's start. Yeah, Hi, let's everyone. Uh, so we are very happy to be here. Hope you had a good time at KubeCon. Um, today we are here to talk to you about metrics and end-to-end -end testing and how those things can be combined together. But first, let's present ourselves. So my name is Jessica. I'm a software engineer at Red Hat. I'm also a contributor and approver for Portuguese content at the CNCF Glossary. I'm one of the maintainers of the Observatorium project. This is our observability backend. Uh, we'll see more about it today. Um, and I'm currently working with Go. I'm also interested in distributed systems and also observability. So hey, everyone. I'm Matei. I'm also working with Jessica at the monitoring team at Red Hat. I'm a contributor and a triage member at the, at the Thanos project, as you can also get from my cool Thanos socks that I got yesterday from the CNCF store. And I'm also maintaining Red Observatorium uh, together with Jessica, so yeah, the usual interested in distributed systems, observability, and all of those things. Cool. Uh, so let's go through our agenda today. Uh, so the idea today is that we want to understand what are metrics, why are they important, why do we need them. Uh, then we will jump into understanding metrics and end-to-end -end testing as a concept. So like how this differ from the conventional end-to-end -end testing. What are the advantages? Which patterns can we use? Uh, and we also go through different types of tests. Then we will show how this can be used in real world applications. And at the end, we'll have a demo so we can understand how all of this uh, can be used in practice. But first, I want to ask everyone, um, who in this room has your application instrumented with metrics? Cool, nice. Nice, I see some hands. Um, I first want to share my personal story, how I got <laughs> introduced to metrics on the first place. It was not very funny. Um, but yeah, I pushed a new service to production. The code worked, the PRs were reviewed, everything was okay in my head at least. Uh, I had the code there, um, the tests were passing. Uh, and then the service went live, people started to use it. I saw some logs, okay, I got some requests, but. I had no idea how everything was going, right? I had no idea how my application was performing. Uh, it was a new service, so like, how am I supposed to do that everything is fine, right? Like, how many requests do I get? Like, I had no dashboards. Like, how many requests per second? How many errors? Um, and what about resources, right? Like, I don't know if I have enough CPU or memory, or actually, if I had more, if I provision more. So that's when I noticed that metrics are really important. Um, so why do you need metrics, right? So we need metrics so that we can get performance insights about our application. So for example, uh, you can have your application instrumented with different types of metrics, like number of HTTP requests, duration of requests, number of errors. And metrics help with making your application more resilient and gives you a better understanding of how your application is performing. So why metrics also? Because we, you can answer questions like how much load your application gets, how many errors, uh, how slow is it, right? So you can measure your latency. What about resources? It's important to understand how much CPU and memory your application is consuming. So as I mentioned before, um, yeah, you, you can see if you need to provide more or less resources and configure uh, your application properly. So how do you, how do you, do you do this, right? I think um, in the last talk, we also saw the importance of metrics and I, it was, I think at the end, uh, this was also an example of how you can um, set up your application, but Ideally, you instrument your application with metrics, you expose uh, slash metrics HTTP endpoint, and then there you use a client library that then will help with your code instrumentation. Um, and once you have this endpoint with uh, your metrics exposed, then um, you have a server that then will scrape those metrics and possibly could store them somewhere. Uh, so for example, you can use Prometheus for that, right? Um, cool, like we, we saw metrics are important, but what all of this has to do with testing? Yeah, so Jessica walked us through like the typical use of metrics that we often think about, and we understand that this is what the promise of observability brings, right? 
As engineers, we want to be able to infer information about the internal state of our applications from the signals we receive. And this is, of course, extremely valuable for our day-to-day -day work, as Jessica was explaining, when it comes to monitoring the state of our infrastructure, debugging or tweaking performance of our applications. Uh, inherently, all of these scenarios and use cases have one aspect in common. Uh, we're talking about some sort of live application, right? We're observing an existing system in motion, whether we equate this to a sandbox environment or the actual production uh, deployment. However, when it comes to observability signals, we should not be limiting ourselves only to established systems. Although this is the primary use case that often stands at the forefront of the discussions, it is not the only one. How about monitoring our applications before they're actually running in a live system? Could this bring us benefits as well? And as we'll propose in this talk, it can. We don't often look at it this way, but tests are sort of systems as well. If we think about it, running a test equates to a creation of a system of components. These can be like functions, mock services, or actual applications. And subsequently, the system is evaluated and asserted against the set of conditions. Although these systems are only ephemeral, it does not preclude them from benefiting from observability patterns. So the idea we put forward in our talk is simple and powerful. Let's take what we're used to from running our systems and apply it in the context of end-to-end -end testing. We want to increase awareness of metrics as a part of the testing landscape and to show that as engineers, we can reap immense benefits from incorporating metrics into our testing strategies. And what is even better, we already get this for free with the instrumentation for our live systems, right? Free things are the best things in life. We do not, we do not need to put more in, uh, upfront investment into our applications. No code changes are necessary. If you already instrumented applications, the testing patterns we'll talk about today are automatically applicable. So why not get more value in your testing experience for free? Let's talk about this in more concrete terms. Having metrics makes it possible for us to make more detailed test assertions. Think of a more typical end-to-end -end framework. You spin up a couple of binaries or containers, and then you observe them and assert externally. For example, if you wrote your tests with a bash script, you might base your assertion on the application's exit code. So exit code zero means success, and other codes mean failure. However, just asserting based on how applications are behaving from outside might not always be enough. Sure, the application exited successfully, but can we be sure of all of our assumptions about how the application behaved during the test run? In contrast, thanks to met metrics, we can externalize the internal, internal behavior of the application and assert on this externalized information. Instead of checking the exit code, we can check, for example, whether we always responded with HTTP status code 200, whether we reached an expected number of responses, or whether the expected amount of data was processed, and so on. On top of that, external data does not only greatly improve our capability to assert, we also gain better control over test scenarios. Thanks to metrics, we can check our preconditions more easily. Maybe our application for needs to wait on an event that will occur in some uncertain time in the future. It is not trivial to check such preconditions without knowing the internal state of the application. If you have metrics, this gets easier. For example, before proceeding with testing, we might have to wait on an application to be connected to a certain number of replicas of another service. If you have metrics telling us this value, it's trivial to leverage this for our precondition check. This also allows us to uh, fail fast if the precondition is not fulfilled. Or, on the other hand, we don't have to fail fast, but we can wait until the metric reaches a certain value before we continue with our test. Or, if after a certain time limit the, uh, the limit has not been reached, we can just terminate the test at that point. And even better, for more advanced cases, we can, for example, rest restart our applications, we can retry certain operations altogether if our metrics are not, still not showing the expected values. So when we start to piece all of these patterns together, we can see that we can create more complex scenarios easily. And these do not have to be related only to internal state of a single application, but also to links between the applications. Based on observed metrics, we can run one test with service started, other tests with the service stopped, and compare the results. We can test how applications behave when a dependency goes offline, for example, and then how it recovers when the dependency comes back online. And lastly, we benefit also from collecting various extra data points uh, about our tests that we are, again, getting for free in this case. This can be related to various metadata, such as, such as our application's version, or we can gain insights into application's performance characteristics. Since it's typical to collect, for example, uh, data about, uh, about latency of our request, these metri metrics can give us some idea about the performance. And here we're moving a bit into the benchmarking territory, uh, about which we'll also talk in a bit later. 
Now, before we move on to the practical application, Jessica will talk us through some of the test types to which uh, we can apply these patterns. Cool. Uh, so let's go now over different types of tests. Um, like first, I want to talk about the benchmark test. Uh, this is a very useful test to test performance. Uh, so it, it's the focus of this type of test. It helps you identify bottlenecks on your application. Uh, for example, if you have any, uh, if you are introducing a new API to your architecture, it can be useful to then uh, test how slow this new API is, right? So maybe you can create a benchmark for it. Um, and the way to do it is that, in general, you have a function that ex is as executed multiple times, and then for each time, you test if the output of this function is compared to a certain standard. Um, yeah, and I think it's nice if you are using already Golang, you have this from the testing package by default, so it's, it helps you to like just easily create benchmarks. But the idea also is that you don't um, optimize prematurely, right? So it's not nice if you try to run benchmarks for every piece of code you have. Like, so it's something to just to, to keep in mind. Um, I think the other type of test, this one I don't know if it's very well known, at least for me before it wasn't, but this would be the interactive test. So this type of test, the idea here, is that you pause your application at a certain point, and then you kind of play with the scenario in progress. So like if you have a lot of services, that's maybe a good idea to then see how those services interact together. Um, and today, I think it will get more, like we will understand better once we show a practical application with it. Our demo would be also using exactly this kind of test, so I think it, it's a bit easier to understand. Um, Cool, so we saw benchmark tests, interactive tests. I think those other type of tests, they are also very well known, which is the unit test, integration test, and entrant test. But maybe let's just refresh our minds a little bit. So the unit test, the idea is that you test each unit of your application. So like you, in general, you have a code base and you have a lot of functions, and then uh, you can create one unit test for each function of your application. So it's really testing a unit. It's also a less expensive type of, type of test. So then um, that's why you can also have them a lot, right? Because also you have a lot of units probably. Um, you also have integration tests. And the integration test, the idea is that you, you test how those units um, work well together. So let's say if you have a function A, and this function A has a function B as a dependency, it would be very nice to understand if those two functions are working well together. And that would be the integration test. Uh, the end-to-end -end test, on the other hand, this would be really like spinning up all the components of your application, so all of your containers. Um, so it's a more expensive type of test. Um, and I think also they don't, ideally they won't happen very f a lot. So you won't have a lot of end-to-end -end tests on your application because, yeah, like it's, it's not, not as the unit test, for example. And again, today we'll focus exactly on this type of test, on the end-to-end. -end. And another thing I want to mention is also that you can have, so I mentioned the benchmark test, the interactive test, but you can also have those tests combined with those three tests here. So for example, you can have an end-to-end -end test that is interactive, or you can have a unit test that is also benchmark, and so on. And today, yeah, we'll see also an interactive test and also end-to-end -end test, so we'll see how those how they can be combined together. Cool, so let's then uh, see how this can be applied in practice, then I will hand over to Mati. Yeah, so let's move on to the practical part. We introduced the concept of using metrics in end-to-end -end testing in a theoretical manner, but let's see how, the, how these ideas are put to practice. What we want to show is that these concepts are univer universal and can be applied within any programming or scripting language, but the concrete implementation we'll be looking at is the end-to-end -end testing framework written in Go. So this is a framework which is hosted under the umbrella of the Efficient Go project, which is a collection of utilities, utilities and tools that are readily available for use by any Go project. And the end-to-end -end framework specifically is intended to run complex workload scenarios in isolation with help of Go and Docker. The code of the framework was originally developed with the Cortex project and later was donated, adjusted, and moving to a separate module, mainly by our colleague uh, Bartek Plotka, we must have seen some talks from him because he had like 10 talks at the, at the KubeCon. 
so it's very famous. <laughs> so the framework has few like defining features that, that are interesting for us. It focuses on testing cluster workloads, uh, so meaning primarily cloud native microservices while keeping in mind test scenario readability. The scenarios are run in a containers environment with the help of Docker. And naturally, the framework also focuses on, uh, on putting metrics front and center, which is the feature most relevant for our, talk, for our talk today. Not only does the framework support asserting and controlling test scenario, test scenario flows via metrics, it also provides self-monitoring out of the box. By leveraging the C-Advisor utility, you can monitor the test containers directly and gain even more control and insights over your test scenarios. Lastly, it also supports on-the-fly containerization of your code. So if you're not running a fully-fledged application, just a piece of code, you can containerize it and run it directly through the framework. And although we refer to this project as an end-to-end -end framework, there are actually multiple usage modes beyond plain end-to-end -end testing. As Jessica has introduced some of these other types of tests, the, fr the framework can be employed to facilitate this as well. The framework enables users to benchmark with the native Go benchmarking package while incorporating external dependencies, or you could use it for macro benchmarking as it allows for running testing scenarios repeatedly, and thus users can observe behavior and performance of their applications from a macro perspective. Last mode is the one that Jessica referred to as interactive setup. So this means that you can manually interact with the application uh, and monitor them. And this is also very useful for engaging new users because you can quickly spin up the whole setup just with one, one command and it's all running on your local machine and you can uh, you can, also mon you can also monitor it, right? Let's look at some real-world usages. Uh, we will talk about two projects that me and Jessica are both involved with, uh, that is Thanos and Observatorium. So with Thanos, if you're not familiar with Thanos, it's a CNCF incubating project for highly available Prometheus setup and long-term metric storage. Uh, you could have seen us at the boot here at the KubeCon as well. And we've been using the end-to-end -end framework here to build and run test scenarios for all of our components. Because Thanos is actually a number of uh, loosely coupled components and they need to communicate together, the end-to-end -end framework is perfect for satisfying such complex scenarios with a large number of components. Since it's not always trivial to ensure that the tests uh, run successfully, because normally the components are long-running services, it heavily relies on asserting on metrics as well as metric-driven test run control. Thanos project features a full-fledged interactive setup as well. So this includes everything from synthesizing data for users to play with to spinning up all necessary components with monitoring and tracing in place as well. Second project that we will mention today and uh, where me and Jessica, as we said, our maintainer is the observatorium, just a TLDR on observatorium. It is a one-stop shop for all observability signals. It is a collection of tools which makes it possible to easily run a whole observability stack with some additional functions on top, such as multi-tenancy, authentication, authorization, rate limiting, and so on. So feel free to check out the, the project if you're interested. And here as well, we have been using the end-to-end -end framework to a great success, uh, mainly with our core component, which is called Observatorium API. And we use the end-to-end -end framework to create uh, complex test scenarios across all different signals that we support, metrics, traces, and logs. Uh, because this requires spinning up multiple uh, dependencies, right? Because we are providing authentication, so we need the authentication. We need to connect to authentication provider. We, co we for example, can use uh, Open Policy Agent for authorization. So this is another dependency. We're also depending on external service for for rate limiting uh, that we need to communicate with. And last but not least, we also need to back this up by an object storage for which we use Minio, and we again just run this locally. Uh, through, throughout this, uh, th through this, uh, through the framework. So, having said that, now let's look at the uh, demonstration of, of all of the uh, features that we set. And for this, we'll use a more simpler example than, than uh, the ones in the real world. And this will be just like just to demonstrate and see how this is how this works in the code, and then how the actual tests uh, are run. So, as Jessica was mentioning, we will see an interactive test. I'll just quickly switch this to mirroring so that everyone can see what I'm doing on my screen. Or not. OK, let me try one more time. Let me try 
a couple more. I'm not sure now it's not reverting back. Oh, it's like that with demos. <laughs> okay, sorry folks. Oh, there's something there. Did it work? Let me try to reconnect, sorry about that. Okay, sorry about that. I'm not. I'm not sure if we're gonna be. Okay, now it's completely. If you try again. Uh, okay, let's one last try. It's not reacting at all. So no, now, now my whole setup is. Mm -hmm. Can I help you somehow? Yeah, not so sure. now it's not connecting anymore. It's my, my whole. Like I don't know if it's the cable or anything. I don't know much about. We can try. No? We can can you try yours? Yes, yeah, let's try that. Let's try another port, just, just in case. How is it? The cable is AC minus, that's this cable. It's the same, but okay. I'm not sure. Now it's the whole screen is. Wait, something's happening. Okay. Now I have three screens, cool. Okay. So it's. Uh, start, right? Okay, thank you. It's still not. Three screens. Sorry about that. It's, uh, uh, can also try on mine. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's it. It doesn't want to mirror, right? Now it's yeah. just everything is a bit messed up. No, it changes. Okay. Yeah. Then it. So now we have only one screen. Yeah. Awesome. No, my display is not there. Okay. No, so you want to mirror. It's not recognizing my screen, I think. Shall we try the sorry about that? Yeah, in, in case it's not working, there's, there will be also video in the presentation, so you can watch it for yourself. And there will also link to the, to the example test because it's, it's part of our uh, repository. So uh, yeah, hopefully, if, if you're not able to make it work, then you can still see the uh, results. But yeah, sorry about that. Cool, let's try and come on. Which one is it? This one. HDMI actually. I don't know where she is. Yes, yeah, we could see it. Okay. Maybe we can try new links. Yes. Nice. Cool. Woo! Woo. Yeah. Nice. Let me just check. <laughs> Okay. Also, okay. I can so I can try to. I don't think we have that much time, but yeah. So as you can see, just this is like a, a plain uh, Go test. It's, it's a Go test file. We're using the native testing uh, package. As you can see, we're simply we're starting by setting up the Docker environment, and um, then we have another method to uh, to start the, our application. We're actually using a example app, which is a which is a simple. 
which is a simple HTTP server that is instrumented for metrics, and we'll, we'll be just observing uh, the requests that are coming in and checking the metrics on that. So we're doing some additional things, making sure that we can, uh, we can access the service on, on our host machine, so we're ex uh, exposing the port, we're providing the image uh, for, the, for the service that we want to use in the start options and the init, and then we'll go. We, we're starting and waiting for the service to be ready, right? Second thing that we will spin up uh, is the, wait, sorry, it's okay. Second thing that we will spin up is, the, is Prometheus. Here you can see a simple, uh, simple config for scraping. We are providing the endpoint from, from the app we previously set up uh, for, for, uh, for scraping, so we will see the metrics in Prometheus. Again, we are starting Prometheus, setting the config, waiting until it's ready. And then what we actually do, so here we will see a pause in the test, and this is uh, intentional. So we will be waiting uh, until Prometheus is scraped, uh, uh, until, Prometheus, uh, until Prometheus scraped something, and we will do this based on the metric which, which uh, checks how many head samples have been appended. We'll wait until this is greater than 50, and this shows how you can leverage this to use for checking preconditions, right? So before we move on, we want to be sure that we already have some data in there. We'll also then open the example application in our browser, which is another nice feature of the framework. We have this end-to-end -end interactive package, which makes it possible to also directly open the service, uh, or, or the, uh, sorry, the, the UI uh, that you might have, like a web, web UI directly in the, in the browser, so that it will automatically pop up for the user once it's ready. And what we'll actually want to do here, which is the interactive part that we want to show, is that we will wait and let, uh, uh, for at least five requests, right? So the test will not move on until uh, Jessica has made five requests on, on the, in the browser on that example app. We do this based on the HTTP request total metric. Uh, we're not constantly hitting the application. We do this with the back off, so each time uh, the condition is not uh, fulfilled, we back off and retry again. And we will also wait on, missing, uh, on the missing metric. So this option ensures if the metric is not there from beginning, that we, um, that we wait until the metric appears, right? Second thing that we will uh, also open up Prometheus, see what has been scraped actually, which metrics we have there to gain some extra insights into our test run. And that's it. Then we're, we're done, we're finished. Uh, we can close the test. And now Jessica will walk us through the... Cool. So uh, let's... Or maybe uh, we can... Yeah. Yeah, Since we don't have it set up on this computer, maybe we can, uh, we can okay. either show the video or... No, but that's fine. We can try here. Cool. So... Just a bit hard for me to see, but like now we run this end-to-end -end test, right? Like we created, uh, so let me just get into the right folder. Cool, so now we will rate, uh, we will run our make target. Uh, so it's just a make comment so that we can then run the test. Cool, so now we see already like some logs. Uh, the example app is started, it's exposed in the port 8080, that in, then it's mapped to this another random port. Then we see already Prometheus being started, we see some logs. Now we see that we are waiting, right? Because we want to make sure that Prometheus, has, Prometheus already scraped something. Like on my screen, I already see the browser. Uh, so it just opened uh, after Prometheus scraped uh, some metrics, then we open in the browser. Um, and then now we are waiting for the five requests. So I would try to then move my browser here so you can also see. So that's, that's our example application, very simple, just prints hello from example application. Uh, and then ex is exposing some metrics. Now we try to do some requests. So I'm manually refreshing the page now. And then now Prometheus is open, right? So I already reached more than five requests. Uh, let's maybe check like the metric, right? See if we, if we get something. Cool, so here you see the time series. The metric name is HTTP request total. All of the requests were 200. That's a counter metric, right? So we had like 12 requests more or less. 
Um, and, and then all of the, them were GET requests. Um, you can also check the graph. Like if I change this to five minutes so you have a better view. Here you see the peak of the request coming in. You can also check um, the rate of those requests, um, like per second. So I can check like for the last five minutes. Like you see that it was like about 0 0.03 requests, so like not so much. Um, another thing I wanted to show also, I think we still have time, um, is this slash metrics endpoint. So this is the endpoint that pro our Prometheus is scraping. And then here we have all the metrics that are exposed. So here you can also see the counter metric that we were querying, the HTTP request total, and also all the metrics. Um, and as a last thing, I also want to show how, so this, so as we, we mentioned, this is the is an interactive test, right? So that's why it's paused. Um, but then if you hit this endpoint, this address, then the test will be finished. I don't know why now I cannot do that, but I can also maybe show. Yeah. Okay. So now I hit the, the address. Then if I come back to the test, I see that the test also finished. So like if, yeah, if you want to automatize this, you can maybe like set up something that calls this address automatically and then the test finishes. Um, yeah, I think with that we saw how to set up an end test using the end-to-end -end test, the end, end framework, like how can we easily uh, spin up Prometheus instances, you can also spin up Thanos. Um, and then with that, we had an example application that was exposing some metrics, and in our test, we could assert all of those things, right? I also wanted to, yeah, like I don't have the slides here, but you can also check online, like we uploaded the slides, uh, so we left the links for all of those resources for the end-to-end -end framework and also, yeah, like for the observatory project and also the Thanos project. But yeah, thank you so much. Thank you.